Uh, thank you. Good morning, friends. Um, let me start with a confession. Um, I also almost could not come <laughs> because today, um, actually, there is um, the Asian African Peoples Conference uh, in Jakarta, uh, while the official meeting is being held in Bandung at the same time. The People's Conference is an initiative from civil society organizations, labor unions, peasant organizations, and they hope that they would come up with an um, agenda, a people's agenda for further development in the region. Um, but today I'm here um, to share or to provide a general overview of what uh, Bandung, uh, the conference itself, uh, meant to many of us in the region, particularly me in Indonesia. Um, as you know, there is an official celebration, so to say, uh, being held in Bandung, attended by senior officials from uh, different governments in the region. I'm not really sure how many uh, states are represented in that meeting. Um, and there have been a mixed reaction to that uh, celebration. Of course, from the government side, it's a um, great opportunity um, to introduce Indonesia to a larger uh, context, but also you hear criticism from different sections of the society. Some are critical of the celebration um, because they hope that the government um, would actually put the ideals of building a self-reliant alternative to the dominant powers into practice. So it's not just celebrating, but also building up an agenda that can really address uh, the burning issues of, that faces the third world today. Some are even more skeptical about the relevance of the ideals themselves, whether they were even possible and desirable then, and whether they are still relevant today. For the general public, the conference itself is nothing more than of historical interest or a tourist attraction. There was a large uh, Asian African museum in Bandung, which is um, being renovated in the last, I think, five years. It now has a nice program. It is a great tourist attraction for whoever goes to uh, Bandung will certainly visit that museum. But before an evaluation of its relevance, of the relevance of Bandung is possible, a fresh reading of what the Bandung conference was and what it meant is rather important. But to refresh our memories of that event, I have a three-minute video, and if you don't mind, I will show it to you now. Um, just, yeah, a, a collection of footages from the past. This is the first intercontinental conference of colored peoples, so-called colored peoples, in the history of mankind. I am proud that my country is your host. It is a new departure in the history of the world that leaders of Asian and African peoples can meet together in their own countries to discuss and deliberate upon matters of common concern. In spite of diversity that exists among its participants, let this conference be a great success. 
Yes, there is diversity among us. Who denies it? Small and great nations are represented here with people professing almost every religion under the sun. Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, Confucianism, Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism, Zoroastrianism, Shintoism, and others. Almost every political face we encounter here. Again, what harm is in diversity when there is unity in these sires? This conference is not to oppose each other. It is a conference of brotherhood. Um, yeah, so just to give you an um, idea or some images from the past about how uh, the conference itself was organized. There was a popular reception at the time, but nobody was really sure whether it was a popular reception because of the agenda of the conference or simply because of Sukarno's popularity. Yeah, so, um, but the... The conference itself covered two broad areas yeah, um, in which the participating countries thought of possible cooperation, which is economy and culture, and four other specific areas of concern, which is human rights and self-determination, the support of the ongoing struggle against colonial domination, particular political issues in the Middle East, Palestine, West Papua and Indonesia, and the question of southern Yemen. And the last is um, a general uh, statement about world peace and cooperation. With economic cooperation, the conference aimed to, among other things, provide technical assistance to each other. Second, to reform the international financial system. Third, to establish multilateral mechanisms to stabilize prices of primary commodities. Fourth, create national and regional banks and other financial institutions and mechanisms to discuss policies on primary commodities. None of these objectives were achieved. Technical assistance for development projects in Indonesia came mainly from the Soviet Union, United States, and some Eastern European countries. Renewal of the international monetary architecture never materialized, let alone mechanism for price stabilization of primary commodities. The organization of the petroleum exporting countries, or OPEC, the price regulating mechanism closest to what the leaders of the conference imagined, had a completely different trajectory. With cultural cooperation, the participants aimed to, one, renew their old cultural contexts and develop new ones in the context of modernity and larger world cooperation. Second, to facilitate transfer of knowledge and technology, including student scholars exchange, to the best of my knowledge, there was no significant intergovernmental attempt to renew the old, old cultural contexts. Connections were made instead by artists and writers, journalists and political activists under the banner of Asian-African solidarity. Indonesian students went to the Soviet Union and Eastern European countries, a few of them to China for further studies, but not to India or to the Middle East. The final communique of the Bandung Conference was a moder moderate proposal of international cooperation with no intention to delink, to use Professor Samir Amin's um, um, important uh, concept, delinking, with no intention to delink themselves from dominant economic powers, let alone to challenge the global capitalist system. In fact, there was a strong belief that political and economic sovereignty was possible in an interdependent world. The moderate tone changed in the following years and became increasingly radical, partly because of the growing tensions of the Cold War. 
The conference took a clear position of non-alignment, meaning actively protecting the interests of the exploited, promoting peace and reform of the international regime. It was in the follow-up meetings where the more radical agenda were discussed, so not in 1955, but in the aftermath, like in early 19, starting in the early 1960s. In the second Asian-African ministerial meeting in Jakarta in 1964, for, um, the participants formulated three principles. First is political sovereignty, second is economic self-reliance, and third, cultural liberation. Sukarno adopted the principles and coined the term Trisakti. The Sanskrit term Shakti means ability, a power, which is an important legacy in, in, in Indonesian political dis discourse even until today. The newly elected President Jokowi of Indonesia put Trisakti back into his political uh, program. So bringing back like old slogans of, of Sukarno days um, in today. Yeah. Um, the Cuban Revolution of 1959, the War of, of Liberation in Vietnam and Algeria added a strong anti-imperialist tone to the forum. Indonesian newspapers at the time would publish stories about the international events with a strong anti-imperialist conviction that the time is near. The imperialists will finally be defeated. In the early 1960s, Sukarno translated economic self-reliance with the nationalization of Dutch, British, and American assets. In 1956, Egypt nationalized the Suez Canal, and hence the war that Samir Amin was uh, talking about in his presentation just now. In short, the Bandung Conference generated ideas and practices of decolonization united by opposition to colonial rule, but divided or varied in response to global capitalism. It later waned in the second half of the 1960s with the overthrow of Sukarno in 1965, Nasser and Nkrumah, and the subsequent rise of military governments in these countries. After that, the Bandung spirit had a kind of two-track development. First is the non-aligned movement, which later developed into the group of 77, or the abstract South. And second, the group of governments and movements that continued to build an anti-imperialist political front, consolidated in three continental conference in Havana in 1966. This is, I'm speaking from an Indonesian perspective, where General Suharto is based in the first camp, and the exiled communists and supporters of Sukarno continue to campaign through the Cuban-supported OSPA Organization of Solidarity with the people of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Comprehensive history or histories about the different movements, coalitions, forums, and initiatives which have been inspired by the Bandung Conference still needs to be written. The legacies of the conference have often been easily dismissed and considered relevant simply because the ideas were couched in languages far from the decorous intellectual language of today. A closer look at the specific histories of these forums is necessary and important in order to avoid what the historian of the Thompson called condescension of posterity or the negative judgment, judgments of the current generation about past actions. The whole idea of reviving the Bandung spirit rests on popular memory and has history of the period. Reframing old or not so old ideas and agenda in our current context is a very important part of that endeavor. In the context of cultural and intellectual movements, for example, a closer look at what the Bandung Conference and its organizational offsprings had achieved is very important. Many intellectual projects like the Asian African Writers Conference, Asian African Journalists Association, Asian African Film Festival, in many ways anticipated the ideas that have been circulated through the inter-Asia cultural studies today. The projects have created a huge archive that still needs to be studied. But what has become of Asia and Africa and Latin America in this respect today? There was a significant change in the entire landscape in social and economic terms. One of the most visible elements of this landscape is migrants, especially migrant workers. Millions of people from poor areas in Asia and Africa moved to the more prosperous ones within Asia. Filipinos in the, to the Middle East, Indonesians in Malaysia and Hong Kong, Chinese in Singapore, and so on. Some work under harsh conditions against the ideals of the Bandung Conference, that is, to struggle against colonialism in all its manifestations. Another visible change is related to the global land grab. 
large-scale land transactions with a total of 50 million hectares or equal to five times the size of Shanghai, Zhejiang, Fujian, and Guangdong put together. It involves massive Indian Chinese investment in Tanzania, Ethiopia, Gabon, Mozambique, and other African countries. There is the Singaporean Olam International in Gabon and so on. One quarter of the deals took place in Indonesia and Malaysia, while India has a share of 10%, mostly for palm oil um, plantation biofuel production. The general trend of the Global South to become new source of alternative energy production, um, food crops, reservoirs of environmental services. This is the general trend that's going on in the Global South now. In terms of economic development, there is a large gap between and within countries. Parts of China, India, and South Korea, and to a certain extent Indonesia too, have become an integral part of the global capitalist economy, while the other parts are still struggling for survival. Rapid urbanization created a fourth world enclaves in both urban areas and the abandoned rural areas. In Indonesia, five million peasant families have migrated to the cities in the last 10 years, depopulating the rural areas. In terms of culture, there is less interaction than there was before. The aim of renewing the old cultural context between Asia and African countries did not take place. The Writers' Conference, whose members included famous writers like Mahmoud Darwish and Pramulya Nantatur, has become an insignificant project. The Journalists' Association ceded operation in the late 1960s. The Asian African Film Festival also discontinued, and the archive has been largely forgotten. After 1965, in Indonesia at least, there was a total reorientation of intellectual and cultural life. Students no longer went to Soviet Union or China, but then they moved to um, primarily the United States and Australia. So much has been said about the failure of newly independent nation states to decolonize their society. Franz Fanon pointed at the incompetent and corrupt middle class, while the movements and parties on the left talked about unfinished revolutions due to the semi-colonial nature of the newly independent societies. Contemporary critics added the Cold War to the list of problems that the newly independent states failed to address. Indonesia, Korea, and Taiwan, of course, are being good examples here. In 1965, the incompetent and corrupt middle class in Indonesia launched a military operation to overthrow Sukarno with the support of the US and Britain. The subsequent national development after that was erected on a culture of fear. Another source of problem, according to some critics, is the doctrine of national unity, which excludes social differences, such as gender, class, race, and ethnicity, from the list of issues that needed to be addressed in the decolonization process. Apart from the division between colonized and colonized was also the problem of national difference between and within nations. In some instances, social differences among the native population facilitated colonial exploitation. In the Bandung Conference, social difference was marked by the absence of women and young people. Political leaders, all male, presented themselves as fathers of the nation, Sukarno, Nehru, Nasser, and Kruma. Leaders thought of modernization of the country as the solution to colonial problems. At the heart of this modernization project was the modern and rational subject of the post-colonial society. The ideal figure was that of the engineer for their role of constructing the country and the nation in both literal and figurative sense. In Indonesia, in my time when I was a student, uh, late 1980s, the question always said, which are you going to choose? Are you going to be an engineer, medical doctor, or a lawyer? Outside of all these three, are not real jobs. That's what the common uh, thinking is in Indonesia. And of course, I didn't choose any of them. Um, Numerous large-scale projects of which the building of dams was probably the most visible. It was the national pride of the new nations, Jati Luhur in Indonesia. Nehru talked about dams as the temples of modern India, but later talked about the disease of gigantism in national development uh, because of the, 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 um, the building of these dams and the effect that they had on the environment. There is still the Akazombo Dam on the Volta River by Nkrumah, Nasser Aswan Dam on the Nile River and so on. So dams are, um, are signified that period of modernization. There was a strong inclination towards Soviet-style development with large investment in infrastructure as the basis of a solid and autonomous national development. Specificities were to be absorbed by the general economic process 
or even being left out or left behind. The physical manifestation of this inclination was the dam. Governments built large dams to, con to control water supply, general steel production to create their own machineries, which would eventually lead to the creation of modern agricultural economies. That was the plan. In intellectual life, there was a strong emphasis on natural sciences, more than social sciences and humanities. The de developmentalist paradigm is rooted, and um, here we can see that the developmentalist paradigm is actually rooted in the colonial times. Um, and then have been usually useful um, scholarly works produced on this issue about how technology was invented to manipulate nature in order to maintain profitability, beginning with soil chemistry in the 19th uh, century. Um, so to end my presentation, I start with a question of like towards a new Bandung with a question mark. Is it possible or is it even desirable? And if it is, then what is the way to um, approach it? Some scholars are enthusiastic about the idea of reviving a new Bandung in the current context of capitalist globalization. In 2005, the Inter-Asia Cultural Studies Journal published a special edition. Samir Amin was among the writers who contributed to that um, uh, edition. Um, Chu Hyong, an advocate of the idea from South Korea, wrote about the Bandung spirit as a non-aligned self-help organization against the dominant powerful countries. Samir Amin in that journal in an interview supported the idea of building a political front of Asian and African countries against imperialism, which is, according to him, the revival of uh, the non-aligned movement as a three-continental front. Others were more skeptical about the potentials and focused on the mythical aspect of the Bandung Conference itself. And one of the biggest questions that emerged from that uh, discussion is about the role of the nation state in such struggles. The states do not necessarily represent the popular classes. In fact, their interests may contradict and result in clashes between the two. Indonesia of 1955, for example, is completely different from Indonesia of 1975. Sukarno's national popular coalition pushed a radical agenda of decolonization, and the entire endeavor was crushed by the military coup in 1965 by General Suharto. But even if we put that history aside, there are still serious questions about the compatibility, compatibility of the nation state with the radical agenda of decolonization, and also to borrow Kwan Singh's term, with deimperialization. In mid-1990s, after the commemoration of the 40th anniversary of the Bandung Conference, serious discussions, they go beyond celebration, began to take place in Indonesia about the political potentials of a new Bandung. And it resulted in the emergence of a new global justice movement. And then came the World Social Forum and similar initiatives, people, people, people's conferences, and also anti-globalization protest movements, and so on. And yeah, as I said today, there was a small Asian African People's Conference in Jakarta, and also a large mobilization of, of several labor unions and peasant organizations in Bandung. But reflecting on these initiatives, I think there are important elements that are still missing. One is the rewriting of the intellectual and political history of the Asian African movement in discourse as alternative sources of today's political imagination. It is an important part of the decolonization of knowledge. Second is the redefinition of the nation state, both the nation and the state and the connections between the two. The nation nationalism has both progressive and conservative sides. It is a genus faced phenomenon, and so is the state. And third, the changing role of capital in the formation of the world order. What does the rise of BRICS mean to the capitalist world system? The BRICS governments have a sub-imperialist inclination, while the social movement, not necessarily opposed to the state or the governments, in those countries are part of the struggle for real alternatives. So you have a very dynamic situation where states, um, social movements sometimes coalesce, sometimes um, collide with each other in shaping the agenda. Um, and, it's, and it's a very dynamic process and there's no other way for me, um, I think, and except for getting engaged uh, in these um, dynamics. And what needs to be discussed 
here is how these various movements, initiatives, and interventions are related to each other. So, where do we begin to look for potential alternatives? I will point to two areas. Um, first is the rural and forest areas which have experienced rapid social and economic change in the last decade. This is where the fiercest bat battles for new alternatives are being fought today and the most interesting and inspiring counteractions take place. The rural and forest area are also home to what I would call counter-enclosure movements like the community-based reforestation movements in Indonesia, the Tarun Bharat Sang resistance to the Silent Valley project in Kerala, India. You have the new rec rural reconstruction movement here in China. And you have literally thousands of, of um, ecological movements involving local indigenous uh, communities all over the world. The second is that the, the new urban centers that were created in the last two decades. Um, the home of the proletarian diaspora, the migrant workers, sailors and transportation workers, and also other transnational jobs. There has been little documentation about their po political aspirations beside, despite the massive protest movements that they were able to mobilize. You had huge um, demonstrations by Filipino migrant workers in Hong Kong. Um, in, in, Indonesians were involved as well. And um, what I heard, uh, strikes occurred also in the Middle East in oil um, production sites um, by these migrant workers. So put together, these instances, instances may provide clues about the formation of new transnational collectivities. The challenge now is how to bring them into conversation with each other. It is in this context that I think a new round of conversation about the legacies of the Bandung Conference should start. I will end there. Thank you.